Okay, welcome everybody. Um, thank you for joining us this evening. I'm Adrian. I'm with Reston Library, and it's my pleasure to introduce Shabnab Curtis, um, Integral Life Coach, and our guide this evening for learning how self-growth happens. Thank you. Thank you so much, Adrian. Thanks for hosting this uh, workshop, and thanks everybody for being here. It's uh, really my honor to see that uh, you're all here. You're um, dedicating your time to this workshop and and I genuinely hope that um, you get something out of it. Um, it's my passion. I'm a certified life coach um, and uh, this is basically the, we wanted to start the new year with um, the whole concept of self-growth um, to see how we can start it and how we can move it together. So um, I'm so glad you're here. Thank you very much. I am going to share my screen so you can see the presentation that I have. Um, and if um, if you don't mind, Adriana and I were just talking about it. Um, in order to um, manage time, um, if you don't mind, I'm going to, to talk through the slides. And if you can make sure, please, to um, make a note of your questions and hopefully the last 15 minutes or last few minutes, uh, we can keep it open to um, answer questions uh, or comments. Um, I like to have any feedback uh, that you think about. Um, so if that's okay, um, please, but please at the same time, feel free to use the chat. I won't be reading it at the same time um, that I'm talking until the end of the slides, if that's okay. Okay, so um, let me see. Okay, can you see my screen? Uh, do I have everybody? Can you? Okay, thank you. Yes. Alrighty, perfect. Well, welcome and thank you for being here. Um, the The workshop tonight is about our self growth. It's basically um, a human thing, right? Why we are here, um, why we are here, and why we have this life, and what do we want to do with this life? Um, so. It's kind of like the big million question, million dollar question that everybody want to answer. Um, at least I try to gather little things um, based on the research studies that have been done on human development here tonight to um, to see oh. if we can just have a little discussion together. Um, what we are going to talk about. Um, basically how as animals we need to survive um and then it, well we are we are animals but we are also human with a different brain that we have we also can grow that's the difference between us and all other creatures in the world in, or in the earth at least so far as we know uh, what what are the stages of these developments um, and how we can develop, how we how do we know in which stage we are and how do we realize how we can grow? What are the old patterns that we have and we want to realize and then we want to change them or update them because there are so many obsolete old patterns in us that uh, that makes a lot of limitations in our lives. Um, and when we recognize those old patterns, how do we want to grow? Um, and how, um, what are the pillars of the growth? Basically, um, what are the things that we want to focus on to, to make that growth happen? Speaking of survival, um, like I mentioned, we are um, the very basic thing that we at each each creature wants is surviving. It's part of the evolution and human is not different. Um, as kids, when we are born and when we are still minor, in different stages of childhood, um, the most important thing for us is to survive. 
But because we want to survive and we feel unsafe, unless there is a caregiver who creates the safety for us, um, we create patterns in us only to survive. Most of it, a lot of it is not based on growth. Um, the curiosity comes when we are little kids, but it's, it's based on the innocence that we have. But when we become adults, then we are most of the time, we are very stuck with those old patterns of survival. And then when we become adults, we are so busy living this life, right? We don't even understand how this busyness of life puts pressure on us, how much stress we have, um, we have to tolerate and how much damage the excess stress of daily life can bring to our lives. Um, but we don't even feel it. We don't even understand it. Um, we are not even conscious a lot of times. We, uh, we are in trance, you know, some teachers, they say that we are in trance. Um, and, you know, in a blink of an eye, we see that many years passed by and um, we are just overwhelmed. We feel uh, what happened or we doesn't we don't feel fulfilled. Um, that's because we we just tried to survive. We didn't grow as much as we wanted. And we uh, we still had potential that it's not realized. It's not actualized. So the very first thing is to to be aware of how much stress we have in our life and what we want to do with it, become conscious about it. Um, and then when we accept that, then we start growing. That really like that's the very main first big step that can help us, that acceptance that can help us to take other steps. Um, I just wanted to bring a little bit of um, very fundamental things that um, our basic needs or our fundamental um, brain motivational networks that we have. So with this, you see how we want to survive and then how we can actually use these fundamental concepts to grow and bloom. The, the three motivational brain networks are, one is we want to avoid pain. These are all really subconscious. Brain already automatically does that. We want to avoid pain in any form. We want to avoid physical pain. We want to avoid emotional pain. We, we usually approach pleasure. Um, so if it's, if it's unconscious, then we can imagine that we want to push pain under the rug and go after pleasure of so many different things that um, we even sometimes know we shouldn't do it. You know, not like, let's say like smoking and name it like uh, from smoking, shopping um, or so many other escapes. But if we want to grow, then we want to go after real pleasure and we want to have the deep pleasure of life. And then attachment to others. And because of the attachment to others, that is very necessary for us. I just wanted to bring the two basic needs that we have, attachment and authenticity. Attachment is survival. There are research studies that suggest when we, like they had babies, infants in, um, in um, nursing places, in um, orphanages, and they, uh, when they didn't pay attention to their babies, to the infants, uh, when that attachment bond didn't exist, uh, the babies didn't survive, they, they died. So um, attachment is a very important uh, survival instinct for us, all mammals, especially us, because, because of the frontal lobe, we actually have more meaning with the attachment the whole deep communication and connection that we want to have with our loved ones. And we want to feel belong. We want to, uh, to feel that, that deep connection. Um, so authenticity and attachment are two basic needs for us. However, when we are in trance, when we are um, under survival mode, um, and when we live under the survival state of being, we most of the time we 
we sacrifice authenticity for attachment. That's why we stay in bad relationships for a long time. Whatever relationship you can imagine, how many years did I stay in that bad marriage or that friendship or um, or did not even want to see that there is something wrong between me and my child that we could bring it up and we could solve it. So a lot of time um, just to just to hang on um, to that attachment, uh, we sacrifice a lot of authenticity. So these basic structure is here now with us. Now, how we can, how can we grow um, with all these unconscious things that is going on in our brain and in our body? How do we want to bring it to our consciousness? How do we want to help ourselves to grow? Um, basically, a lot of time we 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 usually have basic based on research studies that nowadays are uh, coming out. They suggest that we have horizontal growth and vertical growth. Horizontal growth is um, just learning more and more and more skills. You know, all the accomplishments that we have in so many different aspects of our life, whether it's as a parent, is as an employee, as a, as a student, these accomplishments. But most of us know when we are just in this horizontal growth line, at the end, we don't feel fulfilled. At the end, we feel something is missing. At the end, our heart is not filled. That, horiz that vertical growth, that brings more perspective to us, that helps us to see our reality with more clarity, that connects us deeper to other people, that brings us more to the present moment, that we can have all moments in our life, in everyday life, just watching a little kid having fun and enjoying it. Or, um, or just like watching the little birds and enjoying it. And that's not just the whole thing, but allowing ourselves to really see how life is, the, the, the current of life is going to be present and not to be judgmental, to be more curious. That's how we can grow. That's how growth happens. So basically the, the, the bigger perspective that we allow ourselves to have the, the better we can see things. And that doesn't happen solo. It usually happens with other people because not every everybody doesn't have the whole reality. We all have a piece of it. And then together we can have a better perspective. I have an example here as kind of like how uh, when we grow, we see things differently. Um, you can see if it uh, resonates with you. You can see if it brings another example in your mind um, or something similar to that. And I would like it if um, you can um, have a little bit thought on it. And at the end, if you can share it with us, um, how was your growth so far and where you want to go compared to, you know, what we are talking about. Um, so when we have little perspective and when we are kind of like very um, like just seeing our own nose, um, if if a, if a friend start like, you know, complains over and over and over, then I can simply say, oh, this friend is a complainer. I can't talk to her. If I open my perspective and try to have self-compassion and compassion, then I can see a little bit bigger perspective and see more in that friend. And I can say, this, this friend complains and expects a lot. Considering her background, I try to understand her, but talking to her makes me drained. So here you see that he she also had a tough background, but you also have a little self-compassion that she also makes me feel drained. Now let's let's open our perspective a little bit more and try to understand the friend and ourselves a little better. Then we would say, this friend with life challenges she's had behave really bitter. I understand her, but I need to relax and soothe myself 
after talking to her. You see, with a bigger perspective, now the person is not a complainer anymore. It's her behavior. We are separating the behavior from the actual person. It's not the whole person. And at the same time, I don't only feel that I'm drained when I talk to her. I feel that after I talk to her, I need to relax and suit myself. But we can still make our perspective a little bigger. So when we have a bigger approach to this friend and the connection that we have with this friend, we can bring more clarity to what we see. And we could say, it seems that the life challenges she's had, she has experienced, has taken a toll on her. I am sure I have that in me too. Now I have, I, I can see myself too. My heart goes out to her. I understand why she could show some bitter behavior. Not all her behavior are bitter because we see more reality. We, we are not black and white anymore. And then I say, I might have capacity to support her if she asks. I can talk to her every now and then, but I also need to respect my, my own boundaries. You see how we open up when we know more about the person, about ourselves, the self-awareness, self-compassion, compassion with other people, putting myself in her shoes. But at the same time, we don't jump on it that like, even if she doesn't ask, we want to help her, we want to fix her. We say that a lot of time. Um, so we become a lot more non-judgmental and curious. And that's how we want to grow and open up to life and other people. Now, I would appreciate if anybody has any example that at the end you can share with us. I would love to hear it. It's always, it's always like um, I learn a lot from your examples and it, it always has a lot of wisdom in it. Okay, so... We want to grow, uh, we want to open our perspectives, but where are we? Uh, what are we doing? And how do we even know what we are doing at the moment? Um, I don't know if you can see it because this is, um, I don't like this, but um, I don't know what to do with it. I, I hope it's not blocking the, um, the screen. But what you see, this graph that you see is based on many, many years of um, research studies that um, Dr. Susan Kukruter has done. And that is also based on research studies that other uh, researchers have done before. Um, and hopefully um, there are people, um, I personally am very, very um, interested in this um, research study. Um, and hopefully I'm one of those that I can continue uh, working on this. But um, overall, uh, the ego development theory is um, dividing the stages of growth to almost nine different stages um, that we go through each one of them. But I want you to look at this graph and to see how you see like it's called ego development it's because in the very first half of the graph, you see that the graph is going up. We are building our ego. We are building our identity. And then we are gathering knowledge. We are putting the pieces of puzzle together. Um, so it's a lot of self-identification. It's a lot of self-determination. And then we get to the point, that's the conventional side of the phases of these stages of growth. These are all fall under the category of conventional stages. But we get to a point that we are like, okay, I have accomplished I, everything I wanted. I, I have everything or I want more, I want more, I want more, or I have everything that I want, but my heart is not fulfilled. And then that's when we start self-questioning. That's where we start questioning our beliefs and uh, looking at other with more curiosity rather than judgment. 
So what we do here, we begin to have more self-reflection and also we begin to deconstruct our ego. The highest the ego is when we are self-determining, which is absolutely necessary for any human to go through this. None of it is bad or good. But then the humbleness starts when we are when we try to, to deconstruct our ego, when we try to question all those black and whites that we believed. We bring more shades of gray in it. We accept um, there are so many more points of views in this life. And then we believe that we can grow more. And we, we, we go to our self-actualization that you probably all heard from um, the, the 60s that it became, um, I, I am not good with names, but um, Maslow, <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, the, the basically then the pyramids uh, of needs of Maslow, it uh, comes in here that uh, we are kind of like getting to the higher needs of uh, being a human. And we are out of that survival state of being. And we we see that we have potential and we we are bigger than that, the, the stress of life and everything. And we want to contribute to life more. Um, and that's that all falls under the post conventional. And then it gets to, you know, like way beyond um, self and it goes to non duality and everything. And that's pretty hard for me to explain because um, not many people have experienced that, or at least um, I have heard of people, but I haven't met anybody who has. Uh, really uh, have gotten to that non-duality. Now, there are teachers, of course. A lot of people have um, great traditions to follow, Buddhism, Christianity, Islam, um, and many, many, many Hinduism, many, many more traditions. And there are peoples who are secular, but they still believe in that non-duality. Um, there is another thing in this graph that I want um, to bring your attention. You see that um, it says 80 to 85% on the bottom part of the graph. That's the population, the percentage of the population. So this is mostly based on the population in the United States. Um, 80 to 85%, um, they sadly, I want to say that we come and go um, in this life, but we don't get to the post-conventional um, stages. Um, a lot of uh, a lot of us, sadly, we uh, we just stay. We just get stuck in that self-determining. Um, and then, fifteen to twenty percent of the population, they feel they want more of life, or at least. Maybe a lot of people know they want more of life, but they can unstuck themselves. Uh, opportunities ha happen and, um, you know, determination and a lot of different things come together for um, some less population to really to open up themselves to life. Um, but if you are here, that means you have a lot of questions about self-growth. So hopefully, and it's not something, like I said, it's not something solo. It really happens when we all can go together um, and, and try uh, trial and error and getting to know ourselves and share with other people, share our stories and everything. And that's when we can have more wisdom. Now let's look at the details of uh, some of these stages um of the ego development theory um self-centric so it's basically when the baby is born um it's um you know like um, the, the baby wants to listen to the caregivers the baby is very attached to the caregivers um it's like a lot of conformity and a lot of self-identity um, and kind of like babies start looking at like their hands, they figure out their hands, their, their feet, their whole entire self. And it, it goes on for a few years. And there are like, of course, more details in the development of child. But um, self-centered stage is basically that, that area of life that is mostly like as a minor child. 
And then we get to teenage years and we become group centering. Um, just imagine teenagers around you, the teenagers that you know, it's very important for them to be part of a group, to be accepted by the group. Um, they, um, they define themselves with the group. They, um, they want to feel that belonging and, um, and the group, um, there is not much self-identity. It's like the self-identity becomes with that group, becomes one with that group. Um, if we imagine, you know, like, um, I'm not a sport person, but let's, let's say like, I'm sitting in a stadium in the seat and I'm kind of like, uh, part of this group I'm watching, like if I do it ever in my life, it would be soccer and I'm watching and I'm like so excited, a goal. And then I go beyond and above. Right. But that's part of group centric. But if we are, if we get stuck here subconsciously, if we don't know that we are stuck here, which there are, there are adults that are stuck here. They haven't gone further. Um, that's dangerous. That that's like a lot of potential that is not that has not become actualized, and it can become it can come out in a very different way. That's why that sadly we see like all these um, really violent fights at the end of the games uh, around the world. I'm sure you've heard of it too. But that's basically the group centric. So if we are consciously sitting in that seat and going for the team that we know and we know what we are doing and we don't we don't get carried away, uh, of course we want to be in this stage and then we go to the next stage when we need it. But we don't want to get stuck here. This is these are like the the features, the the characters of this stage. And then when we develop a little bit more, now I want to, um, to say something before I go further. Of course, this is a purely Western research. I'm sure if we want to expand this research, which could be like one of my dreams, let's say like I, I was born and raised in Iran, or like, let's say, take it to Iran or let take it to India or take it to a country very different with very different culture, this will be modified because of the impact of the culture. But in general, um, you probably can see yourself and can see others falling under these different stages. So we, we become a skill center. That what does what does that mean? That means that we um, basically uh, feel that feel our own individualism, and I'm now in a way that like I know I have potential. I want to learn. I want to use my potential and to be very skillful at something. We are very proud of it. Um, we uh, kind of like, um, we, we enjoy, we, we really enjoy learn, being skillful at something, um, but we also define ourselves with that, uh, whether it's education or it's any type of skill that we have, um, it becomes our, our identity. That's when it's like, that's when it shows its limitations, when it becomes our identity. Usually at this stage, when we are not conscious about this stage, when we are still in this stage and not having gone further, uh, we feel that we have figured everything out. We have a lot of shoulds and musts and corrects and this and wrongs. And we are very black and white. We are like, um, we think we know everything. Uh, it's very hard to have self-reflection. We don't like to have feedback. Usually, um, if I identify myself with my skills, um, let's say um, if if my whole identity is being my a life coach, um, if I make a mistake, I don't want anybody to see it because my entire identity goes under question. Or if I do it, I push it under the rug 
And if you do it, then I judge you because I feel good because I'm like, oh, see, I'm better than that. I'm better than her. So these type of judgments come come up um, and um, it it limits us to kind of like being very, very small in our life, just to that skill. We don't pay as much attention to other sides of life. When we get stuck here, um, every, emotions are not as much <clears throat> um, valuable. We just want to, um, we just want to analyze everything very logically with rationality. Um, so you see the limitations. But when we pass this, when we develop ourselves more, then we can consciously come back to this and become a, a physicist Nobel Prize or 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 the best skill, the best skilled person in knitting or or the best skillful coach or anything is perfectly fine. We need it. But when we are not conscious about it and we are stuck here, then it brings a lot of limitations. So when we see the limitations here, we want to go further. We want to see more of life. And then we come to that stage of self-authoring, self-determining. It's more becoming an individualist. It's the more of me wants to come out. So we are still building our ego. We are still building our identity. Um, and this is still under the conventional stages of development. Um, so there is something here that a lot of people get stuck and it's because the culture and the structure of capitalism that we live under the, under it is very rewarding for this stage. This is the stage that I compare myself with others for what type of a house I have, what type of education I have, what type of a car I have, and I want to achieve, achieve, achieve. I want to, I want, I'm in a lot of competition with other people. I follow influencers and I want to have the exact vacation that they had. Um, I want to have that perfect picture, family. Um, and these are, none of it is bad as long as we are conscious about it. I, I just want to say it over and over because these are steps we have to go, we need to go through it. But when we develop more, then we come back here and I'm like, yeah, this is the house that I want to live, but it's the one that I want to live, not because she has this house, you know, that competition goes away when we develop further than this, this is step. Um, but this is step has a lot of stress. It brings a lot of fast speed of life in our day-to-day -day life um, that takes us away with everything. And we don't even have time to think about anything. We are constantly um, kind of like enjoying to plan and do, plan, do, plan, do. Um, but at one point, we kind of like drop. We feel like, wow, 10 years passed by. What have I done? My heart is not full. Uh, my, children's, uh, my children are leaving the house. And did I enjoy uh, being with them? Um, so a lot of it happens when we are in this stage. And because it really grabs us, um, sadly, a lot of us stuck in this stage and we don't give ourselves the chance or we don't have the chance to move further than this. Um, in this stage, um, we, still, we still try to have more um, analysis and rationalization, but we start feeling our emotions too. Um, we start kind of like um, even feeling other people's emotions too. So we can work with other people, we can collaborate with other people, um, but that notion of competition is still very strong. Um, but we have started to, when we get to the limitations and there are moments of exhaustion that like, why am I just running a hundred miles per hour? that's when we see the limitations. And then um, 
I want to say, luckily, there are so many people that in so many different ways are now allowing themselves to experience life in a different way. Uh, one of them is uh, the big uh, movement of resignations. Uh, a lot of people are finding that um, corporate job is good for them. A lot of people are finding that corporate job is not the right structure for them. They have um, different capacity and that's another completely workshop, but just to say it very quickly is that there is a spectrum of attention for us. I can be a jackrabbit or I can be a turtle. I can not focus or I can focus a lot. If I'm in the, the side of the spectrum with the turtle, then yeah, I probably flourish in a corporate culture in that structure. But if I'm in this part of the jackrabbit in this side of the spectrum that I have to jump from one to another, it's completely normal, except if I'm on the end of the spectrum, then it becomes a mental illness. But other than that, during the spectrum, it's not a mental in illness. It's completely natural to have the type of like a, like myself person. Myself, I have like that type of jumpy, like I want to do this and this and this. That's not necessarily multitasking. It's switching off and on, but that's the way that my brain structure is. And I might find myself that I can only work in a, a place that the structure is not as rigid. It doesn't tell me, it doesn't instruct me because I am a different type of a, I have different type of a personality. So that's why that this is, I, I just try to, to focus on this stage because a lot of us are in this stage. They have, we have developed to this, but we see, we hear the noises in our in our ear, in our heart. And then a lot of time we just um, let it go and we don't pay attention to it. Um, that's basically the last stage of the conventional uh, stage of development. And then we start questioning that like, do I really feel happy? Do I really feel fulfilled? I start questioning the definition of different um, different um, different concepts for myself. What is happiness? What is fulfillment? What is the pursuit of happiness? Um, I start questioning my beliefs um, that like, uh, what is the base of this belief? Is it only because in my childhood I had to survive and they told me this is bad, this is good, and I'm still with it? Or is it something that I want to explore more? So we, we start uh, a lot more, uh, we become more curious. Uh, we have a lot more curiosity. And we know at this stage, we know that we can grow. When we get there, we know like, oh, there is more to life. Before we just thought, oh, I figured it out, this is it. And we try to ignore the messages. But when we step in this stage, we are like, oh my God, no, there is more to, to life. That's why that we can have self-reflection, we can see our rights and wrongs, we can say whether it's right or wrong, or is there right and wrong. Um, we, we redefine a lot of concepts for ourselves and for the society, and we accept the society a lot more with a lot more open arms. Um, we never, like if in different stages, in previous stages, we would say, Oh, I, I'm like, I, I, I know that you have a different opinion. Let's agree to disagree, but mine is correct. Here we put everything in perspective. Here we have, um, we accept that um, my reality can be different than your reality and none of it is wrong or right. It all depends on the context of the event. Uh, we know that each one of us has a little bit of reality and all of us together can bring it together. Um, so there is a lot more contribution, a lot more connection with life here. But it can also be disturbing because we start a lot of like self-questioning, a lot of old, old concepts that we've had. 
Um, that's why maybe it's even a little scary to go to this step. But once we step in it, once we start that self-questioning, then it becomes easier and easier. We start looking for support groups. Um, we feel like we are not alone when we talk to other people. We have uh, the ability to share our stories, to kind of like see ourselves in others and others in ourselves. So it becomes easier as we um, as we step further in this stage. I know I'm talking a lot. Uh, maybe in a couple of uh, slides when we get at the end of this, I like to open for uh, questions or um, or uh, comments and everything, and then we can we can move further. Uh, the next one, the next stage um, under the post convention uh, development is the self actualizing. Um, so here. Sorry. Here we see that everybody is developing. Everybody is in the process. Uh, when we get to this step, we see that we can consciously go back to previous stages. Those are not lower. We can have those roles, but consciously. And we can also see if people are in those stages and haven't developed further than that but we can accept them, not necessarily agree with them, but we can accept them. So one example is basically in this stage, we say that I want to, I want to, um, to treat everybody equally. However, not every opinion has the same value for me. And what, it, what does it mean? So, well, I can, I can listen or I can read what Taliban says or what ISIS says, but I also understand that their opinion is so far from the truth, so far from humanity that I don't agree with it. I don't value that opinion. That's where we get a little bit bigger uh, perspective to be able to say, I, I can listen to other people, but I don't necessarily feel that, that that opinion is something that I want to value. Um, we do think a lot more, we contemplate a lot more when we get to this stage. Uh, we have a lot less uh, impulsive reactions. When something happened to us, we have the ability of doing self-regulation, self-soothing, not jumping on the to the conclusion, not jumping to react. Uh, we, we have a lot more wisdom to, uh, to, to see things differently, to be more curious rather than just judgmental and then answer or respond to the events of life. Uh, we take things a lot less personally in this stage uh, because we see that everybody has her, her is trying to damage me. We still feel and see and sense that 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 compassion, that why they are doing it. Now we want to have our boundaries. We want to have healthy boundaries. We don't want to allow another person to damage us, but we don't also react to damage them. We try to understand the situation. And in so many cases, we become actually a teacher to them. At the same time, in this stage, we understand that all of us are developing. All of us are doing a lot of trial and error. It's a spiral that it goes up and we don't want to fix anybody or ourselves because no one needs to be fixed. We can empower other people, but we don't want to fix anybody or I'm not damaged to be fixed. Basically, we get that concept. Um, and, and I just want to look to see, uh, I have a lot of notes here. 
Yeah, so um, basically um, we think a lot more, uh, we probably talk a lot less <laughs> and um, we listen to other people a lot more carefully when, uh, when we get to this stage. And then um, the last um, two stages uh, that Susan Kukruter introduced to, introduces to us are the construct aware and unitive. Um, like I mentioned in the beginning of the workshop, I cannot explain it very well because I haven't even met anybody um, that has been really developed to this capacity. Of course, like I said, we have heard of, from, uh, of, of a lot of people, um, but um, basically when we get to this stage, uh, my limited understanding is that we start really deconstructing uh, our ego. Uh, the self becomes part of a bigger system and we see our interconnection with other uh, parts of life, not just other people, with other parts of life um, a lot more clear. We see how we impact other things, how other things impact us in a very subtle way. Um, everything's um, everything becomes more understandable in a very subtle and gradual way, um, but I really cannot explain it um, very well. Now, at this point, I would like to stop um, and see if anybody likes to have any comment, any example, um, any questions. It usually takes a little while, uh, and I know I talked a lot, so maybe you're already overwhelmed. <laughs> if anybody has an example of um, like the same that I had um, about the friend, like could you share your own uh, steps of development? No questions? Anybody? Oh, we have one in the comment. Um, uh, Magali, um, do you have thoughts as to what happens when someone's uh, growth is compromised during one of these stages? Um, yeah, uh, one thing that I can answer, that's a, that's a beautiful question and very, uh, very timely at this part of our workshop. Something that we have to really consider is um, many people are traumatized, whether it's developmental trauma, it's big trauma, it's relational trauma, it's intergenerational trauma or collective trauma. Um, many of us, um, a very, they say it's a pandemic by itself. Um, and we have to remember that trauma uh, really separates us from life, makes us unsafe, feel unsafe, and uh, really distorts our development uh, because it keeps us in so many cases under the survival state of being. And um, we either feel like we want to belong, we want to conform, or we want to just um, break everything. Um, that's it, it's a, there is a spectrum and i'm talking about the most exaggerated part but there is a spectrum that each one of us fall under one part of this spectrum because of different traumas and like i said i personally believe no one um can skip trauma at least because of the intergenerational and uh and um collective traumas um but you know if anybody anybody's parents or great grand or grandparents or great grandparents have been in the world war two or world war one. So we, we definitely have some intergenerational traumas. We are still carrying it. And that is by itself a, a slow down uh, because we, in so many ways in our life, in so many aspects of our lives, uh, we feel so unsafe 
that we are just focused on surviving. Does that make sense? Did I answer your question? Any other questions? Comments? Okay. So um, let's see how, how does self-growth happens. So now that we know a little bit more, of course, it's just the scratching the surface of this whole theory of ego development. Um, there are so many researchers, they are working on it. Like I said, um, I it's one of my dreams that I can also uh, work on it uh, academically. Um, but um, now that we have a little bit of idea of like, what are the characters of all these different stages? Um, so how does self-growth happen? Um, like I mentioned, I just wanna say it again, that we don't want to we don't want to label anybody that like oh she's in that stage I'm in this stage because we also go back and forth like I said it's like a spiral uh, we learn something one aspect of life in this stage and then we come back to it um, we are constantly learning we are um, we are constantly on the learning curve uh, that's why we have to be very compassionate with ourselves and kind to ourselves. Um, and at the same time, um, it's not linear. It's really like a jigsaw puzzle that you figure things, different things out and put it in the places. And then something else happens because so many times we are just responding to so many things that happen in our life. It's not like we can choose everyday plans. Um, so based on what happens in life and based on the responses that we want to take, we learn different lessons and that's like a jigsaw puzzle. Um, in a different way, it's also like blooming, uh, like a flower blooming. That's how we develop. So when the flower blooms, it doesn't this, it doesn't get rid of the very first, uh, little petals that it has, right? They are all together, all beautiful. Or like in school, like when we go to the first grade and then second grade and then third grade, we build up on each other. You know, that's how we develop. We really need to go through all those stages and we always, forever, as long as we are alive, we need all the experience. But like I mentioned, we just need to consciously go back to the other stages when we need them. Um, we, we have to, we not have to, but we want to come to the point that everybody is in the self, in, a, in the growth process um, in one way or another. We are all learning and we are all dealing with different challenges of life getting more complicated with the complica complexity of the technology now and different demands of culture and everything. So that's where we really need to um, really rethink about the concept of self-kindness, empathy, compassion for other people and ourselves. We have to remember that everyone has a potential to realize not everyone, everything. It's the seed that we plant, the trees, the flower, it's the bird, and every one of us humans. No, now not everything and everyone has the same potential, but everybody has a potential that needs to realize, that, recognize and realize and actualize. And that's when where we can empower each other, believing that this other person is not just lazy, this other person is not just an idiot, this other person is dealing with something that doesn't allow the person to re recognize, realize, and actualize his or her potential fully. Um, and the, the whole thing is we don't want to be stuck in the survival state of being uh, because we are 
we have more capability than monkeys and lions and cats. We have this uh, frontal lobe that help us to, to do uh, rationalization, analysis, um, and to kind of like uh, bring more to life. Um, technology has its own um, goods and bads, right? Well, we are sitting here, we are all in this group together because of technology, but there are also, like everything else, technology also has some um, false outcomes too. Uh, uh, why isn't it going? So um, now it moves fast. So this is um, this is the little um, graph that um, I have created. Um, to show how the self-growth can happen. Uh, basically, um, it's the first, the very first step is that we want to, the self-awareness and what are the patterns of behavior? What are the habits? What are the beliefs that we have? And accepting that we have them. Let's say if I, um, I've been working on, you may have heard it in other uh, workshops I mentioned, I've been working on when I'm under a stress in certain environment, I fall to people pleasing behavior. And I've been working on it and I have a lot more awareness now. But the reason that I started working on a new pattern was because I first accepted that I have that with me. I can become flattery. I can become, you know, talking with empty words and not really meaning because I'm so stressed out. Um, but then now I, I accepted it. I first, I, I saw the limitations of it. I saw that how it can actually damage some of my communications with other people. How can it bring me um, across as a shallow person and not really helpful. And then I'm contemplating on new patterns. Um, and then the, the very important part is the practice, because when we want to create a new pattern, that means I have to regularly practice. It's very much like as if you want to learn a new instrument, like a musical instrument. If you don't practice, you don't create those new neuron paths um, to, to kind of like build up on it and become a musician. A, a new pattern, a pattern of behavior, a new habit is exactly the same thing. Um, and a lot of people ask question, uh, what do you do as a life coach? And this is the the, this is the best place that I can explain. I, pers I personally help my clients to have more self-awareness and then I help them to accept that um, patterns that they have now or the habits or the opinions or the beliefs. And then together we work on how we want to have practices that create a new different pattern of behavior for them. Um, it's basically, I can't do it for the client, but I'm, I'm there to show the blind spots. I'm there to remind the client that how it actually, they can do it. It is in them and they can do it. They just need to believe in themselves, but it's just step by step. Uh, so, and that's the biggest difference between a life coach and a therapist, because I know that also has been a lot of questions. So this is the, the, the circle of um, how growth can happen. And when we develop a new pattern, then we realize that there are so much more habits and beliefs and patterns of behavior that we want to go back and um, and change to in order to develop ourselves, in order to actualize more of our potential, to uh, have a fuller life, to live life fully. Now you might say, okay, well that's easy to say that. Like I have old patterns. How do I recognize them? Um, a few steps here that I suggest. Um, you know yourself a lot better, but you can say where you can see, you can you can think about it. Like, where is it that I feel very distressed regularly? Where is it that I feel 
uh, shame, inadequate, or I feel embarrassed all the time. And a lot of them are so, so second nature in us that we really need to do some self-reflection to get to these um, because we just, it be, has become part of us subconsciously that we don't even see them. We don't even see that I feel shame here. Uh, it's very tricky. Um, there are places that we envy other people. Uh, envy is, is different than feeling jealous. Envy is when someone else has something that I feel I wish I had it. Um, so we feel envious of other people. It's not a bad feeling. It has its own message. Um, so what is it? There is a potential in me that I see in me, and it just manifests itself as being envious of others. A lot of self-reflection can help here. Uh, where are the places that I actually see that, that there are changes that I need? As parents, uh, we come to a lot of points with our kids that we need to redefine our beliefs because we are dealing with a new generation um, or values uh, are constantly changing or becoming more complex um, or even ethics are different are changing so um, or becoming uh, the ethics are not changing they're becoming more complex so there are a lot of um, questions that we could go uh, deep in that area um, and also, uh, what are the areas of my life that are out of balance? And I have this little suggestion based on um, the coaching school that I have uh, gone to, which um, basically divides all different aspects of life to eight major ones. Uh, what is my relationship one, with money? What is, uh, and it's not necessarily, am I good at my finance or not? It's bigger than that. It's beyond that. I personally have a very complex relationship with money. I constantly have a lot of, um, um, a lot of um, like inner judge, self-talk that like, am I spending more than I should? Um like a lot of, you know, like those little things that come from our childhood, like, oh, like people, kids in the other side of the, in the other sides of the world are hungry. And I have like, should I buy this? Should I not buy this? Um, so there are so many complex um, communication that we have with each one of these aspects and money is one of them. Um, body, we usually live in a, in a culture that, um, Re uh, rewards us to have to live in our head and only think and we miss our body our connection with our body our body messages so our body awareness uh, can be not very well developed with other people relationships um, that's another whole story that we are going to have a workshop for uh, what is my contribution in life uh, a lot of time we have a job but we don't feel we are contributing and that creates a huge amount of anxiety, but it's a very covert anxiety most of the time. Um, our relationship with our spirituality, that's another big one. Community that we have around us, what is our relationship with our community, with our family? Um, a lot of family dramas that if we have a lot more self-awareness, if we develop more capacity, we could definitely manage it a lot better. And of course, with work, uh, as a, as a, whether it is a job, a career, whatever it is, uh, what is uh, what is its role in my life? Um, so these are all like eight different majors of life aspects that you could go through, write down about what you feel and what's your thought about each one of them to see where you are as part of finding those places that you want to change. Um, and uh, last but not least, there are major pillars for growth. Um, so you can even go through these different pillars and see where you are in each one of them regard to this, each one of these major areas of your life. And these pillars are uh, first of all, self-acceptance that is um, 
very crucial, very important. I see as a pattern in our society with many of my clients, many of people around me, and many of research studies show that it's very self-acceptance in our society is very low. Um, and that's why we can't even um, cultivate self-kindness. Um, Self-reflection is another one. I have a couple of suggestions about it in a, in a future slides. Um, integrated awareness is how we feel, how we sense, and how we bring everybody. Like I said, we, we, we live in our brain most of the time. We just think, but we do not sense our body that has a lot of messages for us. Uh, we want to practice mindfulness, to be present at the moment, to know what we are doing, react, responding versus reacting, as, um, as our big teacher Tara Brock always talks about it. Um, curiosity and novelty is very important. We don't want to constantly have a blind competition with other people. We want to be more curious, less judgmental, and bring more novelty to our life. The way that I can actually enjoy that novelty can be anything but very different than other people. Um, and it can be silly, but if it's mine, it's mine. And I like that silliness. Uh, focus is very important. Um, attention, meditation, um, it's just like one of the very important pillars. And in these days with a lot of, ex with excess of a simulation in our society, this is something that we, we will win in our life if we, if we manage to have a daily practice of focus. Now, it can be anything that works for you. Um, I have to say meditation might not work for a lot of people who have experienced traumas. So it can be in any different way for you. It can be a meditative walk. It can be guided meditation. It can be focusing on writing, focusing on something, but make sure that you practice focusing. It's very helpful. It's very crucial. Uh, emotional regulation, uh, the ones that have a line underneath, like we have, um, Adrian has actually posted the emotional regulation um, workshop that we had last year, and we will again have it this year. Um, I don't know if it's coming up next month or it's in a couple of months, um, but we will have another workshop for emotional regulation. Meanwhile, you're always more than welcome to, to watch the video of the other one that we had from last year. And empathy, I think I connected this to uh, one of my blogs um, that explains why we really need empathy for ourselves and others and how this is one of the pillars of the growth. Um, I do have a couple of slides here. Um, Inner Judge was another uh, workshop that we had. Uh, so you can watch the workshop here. Adrian has posted everything in um, uh, in Fairfax uh, Public Library YouTube channel. Um, and in order to have self acceptance, that this is basically uh, where the whole path of self growth becomes bumpy because the self judge comes in. Uh, those inner judges, inner thoughts that our old beliefs, they come in and they they are very loud and they don't allow us to move forward. Um, that makes self-acceptance very difficult. And this is where we can actually uh, use a lot of support um, because believe me, we all have those self-judges and they're very powerful, but we can uh, plan, we can work, we can practice and we can take their power away. Um, Self-reflection journals, they can be very helpful. Uh, I won't read all of these questions. Um, Adrian is always so kind that uh, she sends all the slides to everybody. Um, so these are some journal prompts that you can use um, to kind of like have a little bit of mindful practice on even a daily basis if you can. Uh, but whenever you can, it could be good uh, to 
bring more self-awareness to see what's going on. What am I doing? What am I feeling? Where am I sensing it in my body? And how, uh, how am I managing this whole thing? What are the things that are actually stressful for me? Um, and the integrated awareness, you see that the brain is only one part of it. Uh, we use our brain a lot, but the brain by itself cannot bring us awareness. A lot of things that we have to pay attention to our emotions. Uh, no emotion is bad. There are pleasant and unpleasant emotions, but any emotion that we, ex we experience is valid and has a message for us. We will talk in detail uh, about it in the emotional regulation um, workshop that is coming up. Um, and then our body, it's not just the five sense, the extraception is basically the five sense that we have, but there is more to it in our body. Our body also feels and is very smart on recognizing where we are in regard to um, the, the um, altitude. Um, even in a, in a room, your body can sense where you stand in a room compared to other people, but it needs a lot of practice and a lot of self-awareness to feel it, to listen to the messages that it has. And then interception, it's beyond our awareness. We absorb messages like in combination of extraception and interception, it becomes below our consciousness. And um, let's say like we enter a room and we don't even know we are smelling the existence of a cat. And I have a trauma with the cat. So my body immediately starts telling me that I'm not safe. I don't feel safe. Whether, whether it's safe or not, my body from the past experience brings these messages up to me. Now, listening to these messages, knowing what to do with them is very important uh, to manage our whole entire awareness and being. This, uh, for this one, we will have it in two different workshops. We will talk about it in uh, the somatic awareness and the behavioral awareness um, that are coming up. Curiosity and novelty, I think I talked enough about it, but um, the only point I wanna mention here is um, curiosity helps us learn more and when we learn, when we have, when we pay attention to a novelty, when we bring something new to our brain and our attention, our brain uh, releases endorphin. That is a good, it's a feel good uh, hormone in our body. Uh, if you pay attention, you, when you learn something, you feel good, you, you, you even in your own body. Uh, so make it more and more and more. And um, basically, uh, have your life as a learning platform because we are constantly learning. The more curious we are, um, the more neurons, the, the more new neurons we create in our brain. So our brain stays more active and the better we feel. Um, we did talk about regular practices. When we regularly practice what we want to create as a new pattern, then these new neuron paths become more and more and more active. Um, there is this phrase, you, you, you probably have heard of it, the neurons that fire together, wire together. So the more, you know, let's say like it's a new habit or you are learning a new, you're learning playing violin. The more you fire those neurons together, the more you practice intentionally, with good intentionality, you wire them together and you create a stronger and a stronger neuron paths in your brain um, that it becomes second nature for you. And at the end, I want to ask, what is the pattern, you know, considering all of it that we talked, what pattern do you think you would want to change in you? What comes to your mind? Um, is there anything you want to share? Um, 
is there any question, any comments, and these are my website and everything, please feel free to ask me questions if you want to email me or anything. Um, and I would like to open it to, to you to see what you have to share. And yes, um, so let's uh, let's just start with thank you for the question. Could you say anything about the difference between a life coach and a therapist? Um, let me just uh, stop sharing because I really like to see you at this point. How do I do that? Come on. Okay. Um, the different, the biggest difference between a life coach and um, and a therapist is um, a therapist can help you to go back to the past and uh, see what happened in the past and help you to make sense of it. And it's very important for us. If something happened in the past, and like I said, I do believe that almost all of us are traumatized in one way or another. Um, so it's very important that, uh, that we can have a therapist helping us to uh, kind of like make sense of what happened in our past um, and come to a peace with it. Now, at the same time, when you start he healing, you realize that you have more potential and you can actualize more of your potential. A life coach can come in when you uh, feel like, like I said, um, uh, okay, this is an example of my me personally, uh, February is the time, that, the beginning of February, I am going to work with another life coach uh, to coach me, uh, and I have to say everybody needs a coach, uh, to coach me because I am not detail-oriented enough, and I would like to develop more detail-oriented skills. Now, the life coach is not coming to give me advice what to do. We are going to uh, create a plan for me that I can practice to become more detail-oriented. Uh, however, when every time I talk to my life coach, I tell her, or uh, I don't know actually if it's a her or a him because I'm waiting for the answer, but I will tell her um, that uh, like this is the practice that I did and this is the result, this is how I felt, this is where, where I got stuck. And with listening, it attentive listening and with the background of coaching that she has, she can give me the blind spots that I'm not seeing. So it basically helps me to, to, be, to, to expand my perspective in that. It has to be in both therapy and coaching session, a very safe environment. Like I said, none of us are damaged and then none of us needs to be fixed. Um, but it's basically one work with how you want to become the life coach help you to become more the therapist help you to make sense of the past at the same time therapists are um are, they are licensed and they are educated to also diagnose mental health issues life coaches are not they are not licensed and they don't have the education to um to basically diagnose. I just want to finish it with this uh, one example that a teacher of mine said, very beautiful. If, if you had a damage on your shoulder and you needed a surgery, the therapist is the surgeon that does the surgery on your shoulder. The life coach is the physical therapist that help you after the surgery to bring this more to life. I hope that helped. Yeah, that, that's a good analogy, um, Shabnam. Um, uh, above uh, Magali's question uh, is one from uh, Isa. I may be mispronouncing that, but um, oh, just so that sure. doesn't get overlooked. Oh yeah, I missed that, thank you. How to manage expectations. My parents had high expectations for me, then I have high expectations for myself, my spouse and kids, but it created lots of stress. 
I have a hard time with, with self-love and self-kindness. Yes, and a lot of us, actually, thank you, Isa, for bringing that up, because a lot of us deal with that. Um, culturally, I can totally relate to it because Persian culture is also come it also comes from with with a lot of expectations. Um, the self acceptance um, is how. Let me think about it. So yes, self love becomes very difficult, but um, the self expectation is basically those inner judges. The most important part and the very first step is to recognize those inner judges and all those expectations that you have. Let's say, let's just start with your own self. Those are the beliefs that you have. Now you can start questioning the beliefs one by one, little by little, but is this belief that I have, that I have for myself, does it still serve any purpose for me? Is that right or not? And then, of course, when you say that, all those inner judges very powerfully come and like, of course it does. This is how you have to be. And that's when you can little by little, slowly uh, start kind of like taking it over that like, does it? Is that really true? What makes it true? What is the backup data for this belief? It's a long process, but it can definitely start with small steps when you start questioning your own um, belief about those expectations. And it's probably easier to start it with yourself. And then it starts breaking up between like ourselves and others, and it brings more empathy. I hope I answered the question. I, I think it got disconnected, right? Your screen froze for a moment, I think. But um <laughs> Oh, it took me out and brought me back. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. Is that what happened? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, it's late at night. Um, uh, I really, really appreciate for you being here. Thank you so much. Thanks for your contribution and Adrian. As always, thank you very much for hosting this. Well, sure, my pleasure. And thank you, Shabnam. And thanks, everybody, for joining us. Um, next month on February 27th is uh, Behavioral Health Literacy. So, um, yeah, when I when I send out the, the slides for this, I'll um, also include a link to that for anybody who's interested. Mm -mm. All right, well, thanks, everybody. Have a good night. Thank you. <laughs> Take care, everybody. Bye. Thanks, Adrian. Mm -hmm.